side. Well, we have a hint of that when Rosneft invited China, China to get into the Banco uh, project uh, a week ago or so, that maybe that's one of the things that's being discussed. Um, I hope Andy will enlighten us on whether there are some non-energy trading stock that may also be involved in an energy deal, uh, such as exports of S-400s uh, uh, to, to, uh, from Russia to, uh, to China, a anti, uh, Russia's advanced anti-aircraft uh, uh, system that's been talked about uh, for quite a long time. So we don't even know what all the elements of this deal is and whether it's all done uh, at, at this point or, or, or not. So that, that's my first point. Uh, economics were not easy for, for either side. My second point is that Russia is really late to the party uh, for the Asian uh, um, uh, energy game. Um, the center of gravity for the global oil market shifted to Asia about 10 years ago. Uh, and Russia's been late. Russia's been late primarily because of a number of missteps that Russia it, 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 it itself took. Uh, remember Mr. Khodorkovsky's project of West Siberian pipeline uh, to Murmansk, which would have been the most sensible economic project if Russia wanted to convert itself from what uh, is uh, its role primarily as a regional um, uh, uh, energy player, uh, highly dependent on European export markets, uh, to a global energy player, Murmansk would have been the kind of project you would have done. Uh, but for whatever reason, they didn't do that. Uh, they were late to the party on the East Siberian uh, uh, Pacific Ocean pipeline. Uh, Japan and Prime Minister Koizumi had something to do with that, but we, that's an old story that we can get into if you like. Uh, but in any case, the Chinese built the Kazakhstan to China pipeline instead because Russia was so late to the um, uh, Asian market uh, in terms of oil. Similarly, uh, some of us who have been in this business long enough will remember the Ikutsk to China gas pipeline, which was about 30 some years in the, in the making. The Soviets talked about that. Uh, and again, we've in, under the, the, the Putin Medvedev period, we've gone through more than 10 years of negotiations on this pipeline deal to China, the result of which is China just last week announced that it broke ground on the fourth gas pipeline uh, from Turkmenistan, uh, this time going through Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan rather than Uzbekistan and, and, and Kazakhstan. So uh, Russia's really been late to this uh, party and is getting competition uh, from, from Central Asia for sure and, and, and elsewhere uh, as well. And one, of, again, underscoring a previous point, one of the significant differences from a Chinese point of view is that the Central Asians have allowed equity investments and the Russians up until now have not allowed large scale equity uh, investments. And, and, um, and, and the last point, which is why I really want to um, uh, keep Shoichi's takeaways up there is that um, the idea, the, his second point, the idea that no, there's no need for consumer countries to compete. Um, I, I, I think as an energy expert, I agree. Um, some of us were at a, meet, at a conference, Tom, uh, in Seoul uh, in the beginning of July, and all energy experts agree that there's no reason for Korea, China, and, and Japan to compete for energy resources. The problem is that you, we agree at the expert level, the politicians don't necessarily agree, right? Um, and, and we've had a number of years now of, of uh, annual um, ministerial meetings of Japan, China, and, and, and uh, Korea for the last three, four years, and which have led to nowhere in, in the discussion. So on the one hand, you've got um, uh, from a purely energy point of view, saying that more incremental supply onto the world market is always a good thing. As major consuming regions of the world, Asia should welcome that. It should welcome all uh, uh, sensible infrastructure to get that oil and gas to, to market. On the other hand, there is geopolitical competition uh, in the region for the same resources. 
and at, at, at a different uh, level and maybe at a policy maker's level that is more important than what we experts believe ought to happen. Yeah, so with that question hanging in the air, uh, let's turn it over to Andy. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jeff. And uh, Jeff, thanks so much for uh, taking the initiative to organize this uh, this panel today. I think it's a terrific uh, opportunity, and I'm delighted to be part of it uh, with my old friends and colleagues, Shoichi and Ed and yourself. Um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, comment uh, here in Washington and, uh, and over the past uh, five, six months since the uh, Ukrainian issue. Um, came to the fore uh, that uh, both here in Washington as well as in Moscow that Washington is to beware that uh, we are we are pushing Russia into the hands of China uh, and Russia uh, emphasizing that well okay Europe and the United States you know we have options and we are going to exercise them and we are going to go to China I guess the uh, the main theme of my remarks is the China-Russia relationship is not all that. Um, and <clears throat> if I'm thinking about the relationship, to emphasize a point that I think that Shoichi and Ed were making, from the standpoint of Beijing, uh, the relationship reminds me of the title of the Rolling Stones' first big hit in this country, which someone in the audience can yell out. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. I like that one. I like that one, Jill. It's not their first hit in the United States, though. Their first hit. I knew somebody was going to come up with that. Head fake. No. Time is on my side. Time is on my side. Anybody who has seen the film Get On Up should actually have answered that question. And if you haven't seen the film Get On Up, you ought to see it because uh, the Rolling Stones were the final act at the Apollo Theater in 1964 in their first American tour, and the tune they played was Time on My Side. Of course, they were preceded by James Brown just ripping the roof off the sucker before they came on. Anyway, anyway time is on my side. I hope our viewers on the internet enjoyed that. Now, I mean, um, we, hear, we heard about the reasons why time is on their side from an energy standpoint, particularly on the gas deal. But, you know, more broadly, it's even more striking. I mean, the, the juxtaposition of the change in fortunes of ec economic powers is, is um, uh, this is already a cliche, but you, know, you go back to the time when I was in college in 1980, uh, where the Soviet economy was four to five times the size of the Chinese economy, and today as we sit here, it's, that's reversed. I don't think there's ever been in peacetime in modern history, or maybe even all of, all of history, the juxtaposition of such a sharp change in fortunes of great powers in peacetime in such a short period of time. And the, the trends for the future are not very, are not very much in Russia's favor, favor either. Uh, a year ago, the Russian Minister of Finance announced that uh, Russia's economic outlook to the year 2030, he was looking at about 2.5% annual growth, that which is about 1% below uh, the predictions for global growth at 3.5% for that time. And obviously, while we don't know what Chinese economic growth is going to be, one thing we can bet on for sure, it's going to be a hell of a lot larger than 2.5 percent or the global average of 3.5 percent, at least as far as we can, we can think about right now. And, um, and of course, even if we look at where the Russian economy was even before uh, the, annex, the military occupation and annexation of Crimea, basically the Russian economy was at zero growth. It was already in stagnation, zastoy. Uh, and this is quite an achievement for Mr. Putin, given that when he took, when he became president again in uh, 2012, uh, Russian economic growth was around 3.5, 4 percent growth. Within the space of two years, the Russian economy came to the point of stagnation, um, and it's possible that it's already in recession today. If we look at the demographic front, even though China is aging and its population is likely to peak. Uh, by around 20, 30 or so at around 1.5 billion, uh, well, the Russian, Asia, the Russian population is facing a much more serious demographic uh, uh, challenges. So the, you know, the population today where, you know, it's, 
China is a little, a little bit less than 10 times the size. By 2030, it's going to be considerably more than 10 times the size of the Russian population. So all of these kind of major trends are not going in Russia's favor in the standpoint of looking at sort of who's got leverage in this, in this relationship. Now, the second point, um, there won't be any more musical trivia questions. <laughs> I was surprised nobody came up with the answer, though. Time, on my, time is on my side. But I guess that's just the old DJ in me. Let's look at the strategic relationship. Um, first of all, the, the first point I think to look at is that each of these countries are on each other's strategic rear, OK? The first priority for China, of course, is looking east right now in the East China Sea, the South, South China Sea. Uh, and for Russia, of course, it is looking west into Europe. That's their first strategic, strategic priority. Uh, for the two of them, I think the most important uh, aspect of the relationship strategically is to maintain security on the border uh, for now and into the future. And of course, given the, the demographic, economic, and we can extrapolate this into military trends in, into the future, that's going to be even more important for Russia as time goes by. So I think for, from Moscow's standpoint, the, the challenge with the China relationship is to try to create mutual vulnerabilities mutual, or mutual, depend, mutual interdepend, interdependencies. So as a way to have some kind of leverage over, over Chinese behavior and a way to mitigate the, the problem of advancing loss of, of, uh, of leverage. Um, if I think we, you know, there's much made about the, the China-Russia competition in Central Asia. Frankly, I think this is quite a bit over, overblown. Uh, one, um, you know, for Central Asia, for both countries, I think is more of a tertiary, uh, uh, you know, security um, uh, issue, uh, not even a secondary security issue. And I think for both countries, they share the, the mutual interest of, of stability there uh, rather, than, rather than instability. This is more clear cut for China, uh, given their concerns about uh, uh, Xinjiang province uh, and the uh, and the weaker population there, and also the possibility of well, the, already the reality of of increasing terrorist terrorist attacks. For the Russians, they you know they are playing a more of a political game, a geopolitical game in Central Asia, and uh, certainly some countries such as Uzbekistan would claim that the Russians are actually trying to foment instability as a as a justification for continued Russian military presence in the in the region. So it's a little bit less clear with Russia. But you know, I think that China and Russia are having this big competition there is just not there. And even from an econo economic standpoint, while yes, sure, certainly in an ideal world, the Russians would like to maintain the uh, hegemony over, over uh, the production of, of uh, uh, hydrocarbon resources, and even more so the, uh, uh, the transit of those resources, the fact of the matter is, is that they don't have the economic capacity to do so. Uh, and that's going to be even more true in the, in the future. Um, the third point, and as we get to one of Ed's, Ed's questions, I think, uh, is kind of looking at you know, how the relationship may, is changing and kind of bringing in the Ukraine, the Ukraine factor. Well, I think one issue of interest, I think, is that the, the Russians and the Chinese had basically, I mean, a lot of, their, certainly if you look at the arms sale relationship and something that they had uh, shared as a common, a common interest more globally was in uh, strategic denial. Uh, the kinds of weapons that the Russians have been providing to the Chinese, those kinds of capabilities, have been principally uh, for the purposes of strategic denial. And denial, of course, to the the United States uh, the Navy and, to a lesser extent, uh, Air Force, US, US military, to raise the costs for the United States in, in, the, uh, in interdicting uh, in uh, areas on the periphery of, of concern to, to China. And at a kind of an ideological uh, level in the global system, the Chinese and the Russians had been sharing the uh, sort of the status of the kind of conservative uh, defenders of, you know, Westphalian uh, 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 um, norm of national sovereignty over the right to interdict or the right to intervene with the United States. They're fairly conservative. Well, you know, things are changing clearly. Um, Russia 
uh, is, you know, with Ukraine, one would say certainly before with, with Georgia. Uh, some would say uh, you could take this, that actually what we're seeing in Ukraine is not, is not new at all, that the, this is uh, the kind of Russian behavior that we saw, you know, going back to Abkhazia uh, in Georgia in 1992 and Transnistria, et cetera. Um, but rather than strategic, rather than access denial to simply access, access to territory. And of course, the Chinese are right now engaged in several territorial conflicts with key countries on their periphery uh, that we're all, we're all aware of. And um, I think, you know, one of the things I've been concerned about, and this gets to Ed's question as to what could be the, the kind of the quid pro quo, what do the, what do the Chinese get uh, from the Russians for consummating the gas deal? For the, for the things that are not particularly, were not directly related to the to the gas deal, and maybe it's not even the gas deal doesn't even come come to mind here. But I think for certain, uh, China would like for Russia to move away from its position of a studied neutrality in Chinese territorial disputes. And with the, <laughs> I wonder when, for example. Uh, President Xi was informed by Mr. Putin about the plan for Crimea. I wonder how much a consultation has gone on between Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi uh, about Russian designs in Ukraine, uh, possible Russian designs elsewhere. I mean, uh, one concern that has been in the back of my mind has been the possibility of some kind of informal condominium between Russia and China about their various territorial disputes. Uh, this is something I just put out there. But I think there are real limitations to that. Uh, for example, there was a question uh, on a listserv that I belong to that uh, came up about Kazakhstan. And the question was, well, what would prevent Russia from doing to Kazakhstan what it is doing to Ukraine? My immediate response was China. China would never tolerate, I think, what uh, Russia's, Russia's try, move to try to make a territorial grab in, in Kazakhstan. This is a country in which uh, China has much greater strategic interest. They've spent a lot of time and a lot of money cultivating this relationship, and I think that would be a no-go. Uh, Turkmenistan, I would also put in, that, put in that category, but of course it's not geographically contiguous with Russia, so some kind of military operation there would be much more, much more complicated. So I think there are limitations on how far, uh, uh, certainly, if there were some kind of implicit condominium, there are definitely, I think, limitations on how far uh, China would be prepared to see Mr. Putin, Putin go. But that is, uh, and that, that is an area, Ed, that I have questions, questions about in this sort of quid pro quo in this relationship. You, read, you already uh, partially answered the question yourself with mentioning the, uh, the arms, arms sale relationship. And I think there we have to kind of watch uh, that. Are the Russians being, uh, are they, rather than access denial weaponry, uh, particularly for use uh, in, um, in the Asian theater, are the, are the Russians providing weapons? And, 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 and the research and development relationship is really the one that I think we have to look at. It's the hardest to look at because it's obviously classified. But are we going from access denial to simply access? And that gets to the, the question about China. Just how, just how aggressive is China prepared to be in its territorial conflicts? I'm frankly surprised at how aggressive China has been for the last three years because getting back to the Rolling Stones maxim, time is on their side. Why don't they simply let the advance of economic power be the lead in basically being able to buy out so they can buy out their interests in these various places? But then you get to political leaders. Mr. Xi, for example, you know, in China, there's a, there's a, there is pretty much of a norm for how long leaders are in power. It's 10 years, the clock is ticking. Maybe he wants to have more of a legacy uh, in this area where he achieves something that, that may be contributing to what, at least for me, from a strategic standpoint, looks to be maybe just a little too forward-leaning, a little bit too, too aggressive. The last point I want to I wanna make, again, it gets, and it gets back to, ah, sorry, and there's one other point about, uh, about Ukraine, of course. Well, with Ukraine, 
you know, Mr. Putin has, if, it, if we didn't think that the, that, I think we were under the impression, the United States and Europe as well, the European security issues have been more or less resolved. Guess what? They're not. The Russians aren't satisfied with that. That's been made perfectly clear. And so uh, who benefits? Well, clearly the Chinese benefit from this because this, along with our ISIS friends in the Middle East and others, are compromising the so-called Asia pivot. Uh, and that certainly works to China's, China's benefit. So there, there's an aspect of the strategic China-Russia relationship almost in kind of an indirect way where China, China benefits. The last point, again, because I don't think the China-Russia relationship really is where the action is at, but when I look at, you know, what the, the Ukraine story and, and especially our effort, the West's effort to try to economically punish Russia, to economically isolate Russia, um, my concern is that uh, there is an acceler this is accelerating a process that was already in, uh, in motion. And it gets back to the point that Ed was making and Shoichi from the outset about, because it's not only the energy uh, issues are shifting from Europe to Asia, it's the global economy. There's a, there's a power shift going on. And the economic locus or the, grav the center of gravity uh, is, is moving back in an Asian direction, in an Eastern direction. And there are a couple, so there are a couple of data points I want to point out to that have happened in the past six months that have struck, struck me, even in the past few months, this summer. One of them was the BRICS meeting the BRICS meeting that took place in Brazil uh, in July. Uh, and there, you know, last year, the BRICS, um, they had the, the desire was to establish the BRICS Development Bank uh, when they met in uh, Durban, South Africa. Well, they didn't come to an agreement about that uh, because principally uh, they couldn't come to an agreement about the voting rights for the bank. Uh, and at that time, the Chinese position was to hold that your contribution to the capitalization of the bank would be uh, equated, would be correlated to your voting rights. So i.e. if the Chinese made a much larger contribution to the capitalization of the bank, then they would have much larger voting rights. China moved away from that position. And other countries came along and they agreed to it. And the, the development bank has been established. We'll see how it, how it goes in the future. And I have to think that in this, that the situation with Ukraine and the response in trying to economically isolate Russia has had an impact on the thinking of all of those BRICS countries about, you know, basically the United States is, uh, the United States and the West's ca capacity to do this, to inflict this kind of economic pain, it's based upon the dollarization of the global, of the global economy. That is eroding anyway we are accelerating the erosion of it, I think, with this, and I think this data point suggested that. The other one has to be with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, and what there is interesting to me is that they've, they're moving forward with the uh, uh, membership expansion. And the key member here really is India. Uh, and there, the Chinese have been opposed to the Indian membership. Now, India and Pakistan have to go in as a package deal to the, to the SCO. That's understood for obvious, obvious reasons. Um, but the, Indian, and the Indians have been holding back on this. Well, they've changed their position on this, apparently. And I, I was in India a few weeks ago, and what I was told by, by economists and, and uh, political folks, folks there was that basically the Chinese are seeing the dr dramatic growth in the Indian economy, and in fact, uh, China for India is, China is India's number one trade partner already. Uh, and Chinese see the, kind of, the amount of infrastructure that needs to be built in India. They want to build a lot of it. So I think that the Chinese position on that is, has changed for economic reasons, I think, first and foremost. But if you have these new members, I mean, China, uh, excuse me, India, Pakistan, Mongolia, uh, eventually Iran, once uh, UN sanctions are off Iran at some point in the future, even possibly Turkey in the future, you know, you are going to, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, this is going to be an organization, I think, that is going to uh, carry significant weight uh, in the global system, and it will be to some extent an alternative to um, institutions that the United States, you know, had a hand in the formation of going back to the Bretton Woods system back right after World War, World War II. 
Um, so to me, it's not that, you know, that the China-Russia relationship is going to uh, be at the, at the forefront of, of this sort of alternative, um, you know, institutional basis for the, the multipolar world that is emerging as we, as we talk, but it's a part of it. It's a part of it, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Okay, great. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask, but since we're um, pushing on time a little bit, I think I'll, I'll save those for now. So let me open it up. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We have microphones in the back. Somebody will come give you a microphone. Um, please identify yourself, and please be sure that you're asking a question and not making a speech. Thanks. Over here. Hi, thank you for that. Um, my name is Natalia Liotta. I'm with IHS in their Petroleum Sector Risk Service. My question is about Russian companies' ability to raise capital for energy financing on Asian markets. Um, given the latest sanctions now, they're really limited from European um, and, uh, uh, financial markets. So if you could speak on that, the reality of borrowing from Asia and any limitations Russian companies may face? Uh, well, maybe others can chime in on, on, on the, the corporate financing side um, of, of things and the appetite of, of banks uh, in, in Asia to, to finance Russian companies. Uh, from my point of view, these energy deals have been um, uh, loans secured by supply. So basically, Russia is forward selling production. Uh, so it, it's, it's really not financing in, in the classic sense of, of, of the term. Uh, you, you're providing a loan, interest rates agreed, and repayment is through the supply of oil and gas later. Um, uh, and and to, to me, it, it seems to set up uh, for the Chinese clawing upstream. I mean, and, and I would say that that's true whether you're talking about Turkmenistan or, or, or Russia. If your project gets into trouble, it's really too bad, it's, you still owe us that $10 billion, how can we help you repay it? Maybe we can help you develop that field, together we can cooperate, wouldn't that be a good thing for us to do? So um, it, it's, I, I, I think the, the idea that there's a lot of Asian capital floating around waiting to um, uh, finance Russian companies um, uh, on the basis of, of its, its own credit standing uh, that's not secured by a project with real oil and gas flowing uh, is a mirage. I, I just don't believe that, that there, that's that kind of money floating around. Uh, I don't think I would, I, oh, sorry. The only thing I would, I, would, I would add to that is that, because this has been sort of part of the narrative you hear kind of coming out of, out of uh, the Kremlin, that, okay, you know, the West, the West is trying to economically isolate us. Well, you know, we have these options and, and Asians are, are, ready, are ready to come in. You know, be up, I completely agree with what Ed said, and just let's remember that, uh, you know, just with, with Europe itself, this is about 50% of the, the, the trade, bilateral trade relationship for Russia and even somewhat, I think, more than 50% for the, uh, the, investment, uh, the investment relationship. And, you know, the idea that you can quickly, uh, you know, replace magnitudes of capital investment uh, like that is, it, even, if Rush, even if the Russian investment environment were considerably more attractive than it is, I think, uh, is a, I think you're going to be hard pressed to, to make that case. Yes, I just would like to add some comment. Although, uh, as we've already discussed today, the Russians, you know, including Rosneft and Gazprom, they're trying to attract more investment from China right now, but the story is not that easy either. From Chinese perspectives, they are already raising concern that even they don't want to take excessive scale of investment risks, 
as I explained already, long before the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis, all energy experts know the tremendous scale of investment risks to do something in Eastern Siberia and the Far East. The second, China, Chinese oil companies have their own business and subsidiaries in the US and as well in the West. They are you know, increasingly concerned they can be affected as a result of getting too much involved in the Russian energy sector. Okay, great. Here. Thank you. Nico Safos, energy consultant. Uh, Soichi, I wanted to ask you about Japan. And you think about Japan, and for the last few years, the Japanese have been generally lukewarm to trying to import additional gas from Russia. I'm thinking of the Vladivostok project. But if you step back and you say someone else is going to build this massive pipeline that brings you either to the coast or close to the coast, what I wanted to ask you is, are you seeing a change in the way that the Japanese are thinking about the feasibility of additional Russian exports once you do build the infrastructure the incremental cost of sending additional gas to Japan will actually come down significantly. What is the thinking of the Japanese, both government and companies, in terms of what this deal make, makes possible for Japan's uh, needs for gas? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Riyad, for an excellent question. I'm mean, just answering completely on my personal capacity, and the question is very difficult and sensitive in many ways. The first. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, well, almost everyone is happy about the recent Russia's gas deal with China, uh, including the, the, the future project of the power of Siberia. If Russia ships uh, more gas and the oil, even oil to the Chinese market, just, it will stabilize the regional energy market, out of which Japan will also benefit. And as an emphasis today, there's no point to, to, to do any sort of competition over Russian resources. If Russian resources are not available, we can find the same amount or even more amount elsewhere, including Alaska, Australia, elsewhere. Second, Having said it so, up until the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis, as you noted, uh, Japan has tried to make more commitment in the Russian uh, Far Eastern projects. Uh, but you know, we have more than a few projects over there competing around, and uh, everyone knows the cost is not low, and they are going back and forth. Uh, which one will come out of that, especially in the aftermath of the, the increasingly optimistic projection of the U.S. shell revolution. Uh, in terms of gas trade, Japan is trying to sh gradually shift the gravity of uh, gas import toward the Pacific side. And third, the whole the business industry to the extent they have anticipated something to, until the eve of the Ukrainian crisis. They cannot easily say, let's give up. They have their own stakes and in investment. And the answer I have heard so far is they simply, don't, they simply don't know what to do. And for Japanese diplomacy, although this is something I haven't heard from any, but I'm just guessing. But you know, any diplomacy needs both carrots and sticks, right, until the very end. And to the extent that we know that Russia's concerns about excessive expansion, or what you call of Chinese influence over the Eastern regions is getting worse and worse. Time is on our side, including Japan. They will need Japan anyhow, how many years it may take. If that's the case, it is such a big advantage 
for not only Japan, but for the U.S. as Japan's ally. We can have it as one of our diplomatic leverages. But we need to have is good combination of you know, Russia strategy and Chinese strategy as a, as a set to, to have long-term constructive framework in which we could position the meaning of today's discussion. I'll stop here. Okay. Uh, yes, right here in the middle. Oh, did you? Teresa Sabonis Hoff, National War College. Um, I have a question about uh, both, the, several of you mentioned Turkmenistan and how that may in some ways undercut uh, Russia. With the laying of the fourth pipeline that's now underway and China increasingly being Turkmenistan's monopsony, um, my question is, isn't it more likely that China uses Russia as leverage to force the price down in Turkmenistan because Turkmenistan is much less of a political contender. Whoever wants it. Teresa, always keen to answer a Central Asian question from you. Um, it, it, as it happens, the day the deal was signed in um, Shanghai, I was in Turkmenistan. And, and, and notice that Deputy Prime Minister uh, Duarkovich diverted his plane from Shanghai before the deal was even signed in Shanghai uh, to uh, Turkmenistan uh, on, uh, I guess this was a convenient stopover to the St. Petersburg Economic uh, uh, Summit. Um, and had a very long, long meeting with Turkmen officials. Um, I suppose he had some news to bring uh, to, to, to the Turkmen. Um, the industry scuttlebutt uh, is that the 